Hello, John L. Street Library. My name is Shannon. I'm a naturalist here with the Woodlands Nature Station. On behalf of Friends of Lyme Lakes Association, as well as the USDA Forest Service, I'd like to welcome you to our program here today. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Woodlands Nature Station, we are a nature center located in Land Between the Lakes National Recreation Area. And we are home to over 45 species of rescued native wildlife. One example of which is Woodrow, our wood duck here. Now, all of our animals are rescued. They're either orphaned or injured. There's some reason why they are unable to survive on their own in the wild. Now, Woodrow, for example, was found as a day-old duckling all by himself. He was rescued by a fisherman, and he now lives here with us. And our rescued wildlife helps us to teach people just a little bit more about the wildlife found right here in Kentucky. So here at the Nature Station, we have a backyard full of native plants, full of hummingbird and other bird feeders. It's a great place to see birds in the summertime. We also have outdoor exhibits full of all kinds of animals, including turtles, a possum, and a bobcat. Now, some of these animals you guys are going to be taking a look at in our program later. Now, this is a summer reading program. And the summer reading program theme this year is Tales and Tales. So that's kind of a fun theme, I think. You've got Tales, T-A-L-E-S, so stories. And then Tales, T-A-I-L-S, as in Tales, kind of like an animal tail, like Duck Duck has right here. And that got us to thinking, what do animals use their tails for? Now the exact answer might vary depending on what animal you're looking at. Some of them might use it for balance, some for climbing, some might use it to wrap around and keep their noses warm in the winter. A few different reasons, yeah? Now. Today, you're going to be joined by myself, some other naturalists, as well as some of our rescued native wildlife. And we're going to really examine these animals and learn why they have tails. What do their tails do? What use are they? Yeah, what use is your tail? Now, as a duck, Woodrow here is going to use his tail when he's flying. It's going to be one thing that helps him to steer by flaring it out or twisting and turning it. He can help direct himself in flight. And also, as a wood duck, he does spend a lot of times in trees. Now, I'll see if I can get him to do an example of it. Sometimes, he will use his tail to brace himself. But he's not doing it right now. He feels very secure on my hand right here. But he'll take, he has a fairly stiff tail, and he'll take it and he can kind of bend it down to prop against something as his, he's sitting. And that will help him to keep his balance. And he does not want to show an example right now. You don't, do you? Nope, no examples? Okay, oh, he kind of did right there. <laughs> but only very briefly. Yeah. So yes, he can use this stiffer tail to kind of brace against maybe a branch that he's climbing in. So other birds will do this as well, especially things like, say, woodpeckers that perch on the side of the trees. They'll lean their stiff tail up against the wood to try to keep themselves in position and stationary. Okay, well, let's go take a look at the animals that a few of the other naturalists have have selected and we are going to learn all about tails today. Does that sound good? Learn all about tails? Yeah? Okay. Now you can watch this program in a variety of ways. You could watch the whole thing, but if you would like to take a look at some specific animals, the following few slides will show the timestamps for each animal. 
we're going to see a variety of live animals as well as utilize some of our donated animal mounts as well. Hi, my name is Nicholas. Welcome to the Woodlands Nature Station Animal Tales program. Uh, this is our alligator snapping turtle. This one particularly is Bob. He's about 40 pounds and about 20 years old, uh, which means he's about half grown. He's still got quite a bit of growing to do. Uh, he'll be considered a full grown adult when he's closer to 40 years and maybe closer to 70 to 80 pounds. Now there are a couple of tall tales about these guys, specifically about their tails. Now one of the big ones, you might notice how I'm holding him. This is the safest way to hold any turtle, particularly something like a snapping turtle. You want to be able to support all of their weight, which in the case of Bob here is quite a bit of weight, and the only real safe way to do that for both you and the turtle is to hold them on the sides of the shell. You do not want to pick them up by that tail. If you notice that big long tail there, there's a common misconception that that's kind of like a good handle that you can pick them up by. You don't want to do that. That tail is fused to the inside of their shell, right along the middle there where his backbone is. So if you tried to support all 40 pounds of him on just that tail, you could very easily damage or even kill the turtle that way, which we definitely don't want to do. Now, most of what they use their tail for is support while they're in the water. Uh, these guys spend most of their life under the water, and so they have to stick just the tip of that nose up and out of the water, and they lift themselves up, similar to how this guy is, uh, and they use that tail for a little bit of added support to be able to stick their nose up and out of the water. Now, their tail also has another super important function. I said they spend most of their life in the water, and that is true even in the winter. Now, when the winter comes around, these guys, like any other reptile, go into a type of hibernation. Uh, these guys, their, their heart rate goes down so low, about one heartbeat per minute, that they don't do much of anything else. They don't have a whole lot of energy to move around or do much of anything else. So on either side of their tail, there's a specialized part of their skin there that actually pulls a little bit of oxygen out of the water. Similar, not exactly the same, but similar to like the gill on a fish. And so that is super important. That pulls what little bit of oxygen they need for the winter out of the water. Kind of like breathing. Not exactly like breathing, but a little bit. And so the tail doesn't provide quite the function we used to think it does. You certainly can't lift one by it, but it is still super important for these guys. We'll get a little bit of a closer look there. And there is Bob with his big old jaw there. Definitely not something you want to try and grab a hold of. You can see the other reason why I hold him on the sides. Not just for his safety and support, which we all need some safety and support, but also for my safety. If I get my hands too close to that jaw, he could snap down with the second strongest bite in North America. The only thing that could bite harder than this guy would be a full-blown alligator. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for joining me with Bob here. Let's thank him for all of his support and I'm gonna set him back down. You guys have a nice day. Hello again, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Shannon and I am back to talk to you about beavers. Beavers are a very large aquatic rodent. Now, in other words, this is an animal that can be 70 pounds, lives in water, and is related to things like mice and squirrels in the rodent family. Now, beavers work very hard to survive in their aquatic habitat, and their tails are an important tool in their survival. Now, if we take a look at the beaver's tail, it is 
very broad and flat and doesn't have any fur on it. Now their tail is useful for a variety of reasons. Now one thing it does is it actually acts as a way for them to store fat. So extra fat can be in this thick fleshy tail and that way if the beaver goes through a lean period where they're not getting quite enough food, they can live off of some of that stored fat in this tail. So a pretty useful thing to help keep you alive. Now speaking of the beaver's food, what does a beaver eat? So we already said that they live in the water. Now sometimes people guess that they, maybe they eat fish because they're swimming around the water, they encounter fish. But a beaver is actually an herbivore. They are entirely vegetarian. They eat only plants. Now a beaver is going to eat all kinds of things, water plants, things like water lotus. They will go after tree leaves and especially tree bark. One amazing adaptation of beavers is their big front teeth, which are very, very strong and which they can use to chew through a tree to knock that tree over. Now once the tree is knocked over, they can start grabbing and trimming off branches and then they are going to be able to chew away that inner bark, which is where they get their nutrition. Now, in order to do this, you have to kind of sit against a tree, chew for a while. Beavers will actually use their tails as sort of like a kickstand. So their tail is kind of really thick and strong, and they'll basically just kind of lean back a little bit on it as they're chewing and use it to help support themselves. So another important use of that tail. And then they also use their tail as a way to communicate with other beavers. Now this may sound a little odd, um, the tail itself isn't able to vocalize or make any noises in that way, but it's big and broad and flat, and if a beaver gets scared, he will take that big broad flat tail and slap it against the water. And this creates a very loud sound that can be heard all around the pond that they're in. And beavers do live in family groups, so they're going to be living with a mother, a father, their babies from one year, and then all of their babies from the previous year. So they're all living in a family group, so if they see danger, they want to make sure that their mother, their father, their siblings know that danger is around. So they take that big broad tail and slap the water. Okay, so a beaver's tail really is a multi-purpose tool. It's used to store energy as a kickstand when they're leaning back, chewing down a tree, and also as a way to warn other beavers of danger. So that's a pretty amazing tale. Hello friends, welcome, and my name is Marissa, a naturalist here at the Woodlands Nature Station. I'm here down our raptor row in the backyard, and I would love to introduce you to one of our newest residents here at the Nature Station. This is Ferris. Ferris is our new red tail hawk. But you may notice he doesn't quite have his red tail yet. That is because he is just a year old. And speaking of his tail, I would love to share with you some really neat things about Ferris's tail and red-tailed hawks in general. Now, their tail is a very important part of their body. It helps them do a lot of unique things to survive. So the first thing I'd love to point out is look how long his tail is. It's a pretty long tail. Some of it is covered by his wings, um, but if we were to have him flap his wings, you could see that his tail is pretty long. And that is really important because, oh, he's gonna show us. His long tail is really important for maneuvering through forest environments where he lives. He may need to catch prey that's running and scurrying between trees, so he needs to be really fast and make those sharp turns between trees in the forest. Now, another thing that's really unique about his tail is that it spreads very wide. If you've ever been on a road trip or maybe even just driving out to the nature station and you look up in the sky, you might notice a red-tailed hawk or some other type of hawk soaring. They have their wings spread out very wide and their tails are also spread out. And that is to give them lots of surface area, which basically just means, he's showing off for us, see? Their wings and their tail are very big, 
And that is important because they catch what we call thermals. Basically big waves of hot air in the sky and they ride them. So having really big wings and a really big tail that they can spread out lets them, much like a kite, just soar along on those waves of hot air that we can't see, but they know are there because they're using them to soar. Maybe look for prey, maybe just enjoy the fresh air. Now, the last thing I'd love to share with you about Ferris's tail is the color of it. Now, like I mentioned, Ferris is only a year old, so he does not have his red tail yet, but being a red tail hawk, when he turns two years old and he is an adult, his tail will be a red color. Right now, it's just kind of a brown color, that's okay. But what's still really neat about his tail is if you can kind of see behind my glove here, the underside of his tail is white and the back side of his tail is brown right now and will be red when he turns two. So the underside is white and the upper side, the top side, is brown or red. We call that counter shading. That is a really big and cool word. Basically what it means is that he has a really unique and cool type of camouflage. If you imagine you are a rabbit and you are scurrying through a field trying to hide from a red-tailed hawk that might want to eat you, and you look up at the sky and it's cloudy out, so the sky is white and a red-tailed hawk is soaring through that sky, we hear you, Ferris. See, he knows. Um, you might notice that you don't really see anything because that red-tailed hawk that's soaring through the sky looks white. His bottom side is white, so with his chest, this part will be what you're looking at, and then his tail spread wide will also be white from the direction you're looking from. So you can't see him. He is almost invisible in the sky. Now, if you're a predator, if you're something like maybe a bigger red tail hawk or something else that would like to hurt or eat a red tail hawk, and you're soaring in the sky above a flying red tail hawk, you will see his backside which is brown or red, which blends in really well with a forest that he might be flying above. So he has this counter shading, this really cool camouflage that lets him survive. He's kind of white, whitish on the bottom and brown on the top. So he blends into the sky and the forest. So his camouflage, as well as his really long tail that helps him turn around all those trees to catch his prey, like maybe rabbits, and how big his tail spreads along with his wings, allowing him to soar through the sky, all allow him to survive and make his tail a really special feature on his body. Thank you so much for joining us and meeting Ferris. Come and visit him at the Woodlands Nature Station. You'll be able to see him um, and have, have a wonderful rest of your time. Hi everyone, my name is John Polpeter. I'm one of the naturals here at the Nat Woodlands Nature Station and we're going to be talking about possum tails. And this right here is Marcy, our resident possum. She's an animal ambassador. And one of the things that I always like to talk about when it comes to her tail is how prehensile it is. Now you may not be familiar with that term, but that's the same kind of thing that helps monkeys be able to grab onto trees. Possums are able to grab onto different objects because of the flexibility of their tail. One of the things you'll notice about a possum's tail, like a rat's tail, it doesn't have any fur on it. That actually can come in quite handy. I want you guys to kind of imagine having, on one hand, a glove that has, that's real fuzzy, and then another glove, on the other hand, that is made out of leather. If you were to hold onto a branch, or to hold onto a rock or something, what would be able to grip easier? Your answer, of course, would be the leather glove. And so, Possums have kind of a leathery tail to be able to help them grip on the things when they want to. Unfortunately, a lot of times on TV and in cartoons, they show possums hanging from their tail. But possums do not hang from their tail. They are not strong enough to be able to hold on to their weight. But they can do things like carry sticks and leaves and grass and maybe even their baby. 
uh, around with them. They may also use their tail to be, to be able to help them balance as well as to grip on the thing so they may not fall. And that's what the possum's doing right now. She's trying to keep her balance. She's trying to be able to, to hang on up here while she eats by hanging on to my hand. Like you would hold on to a parent's hand. Hello again, everyone. Now I'm back to talk about another animal that does use its tail to help it to survive. Can anyone guess what this animal is? Now, this one is a little atypical from the image you might have in your head. It is an animal that is black and white, but a lot of the, the examples of this animal found within Lamington Lakes are actually more white than black. Um, this is a skunk. So skunks can have different markings, and this is what a lot of the skunks here in Lamb Tuna Lakes do look like. Now, the striped skunk, everyone kind of knows about the striped skunk's tail. If you see the tail go up, what does that mean? Yes, this tail is kind of a warning that the skunk is a little bit worried about you, and it would like you to go away. If you ignore the warning of the tail going up, they can then spray a stinky smell. Now skunks have a gland at the base of their tail which produces this really stinky smell and if they do encounter danger they will react by first raising the tail. That's a warning. They're trying to warn you. The skunk can only produce so much of that stinky liquid at a time so they don't want to waste it if it's not actually needed in the circumstances. Now, if you ignore the warning though, that's when they will spray. And it is a very, very strong, very, very bad smell. So most things that get sprayed are going to try to get away from the area. They don't want to smell it anymore. So in that way, that tail warning and then the stinky spray that comes out from the gland at the base of the tail helps this skunk to survive. So that's a pretty cool tail adaptation, I think. It's both used to kind of warn other animals away like hey I'm a skunk look at this tail waving in the air please don't come any closer and then the gland at the base of the tail can be used to keep that other scary animal away from the skunk Hi everyone, my name is John Polpeter. I'm the lead naturalist here at the Woodlands Nature Station and we're going to talk about bobcats. In particular, we're going to talk about bobcat tails. What you may notice is they're kind of short. Of the 40 species of different cats around the world, the lynxes are the ones, the only ones, that have a short tail. And a bobcat is a type of lynx, sometimes referred to as the red lynx. The reason why these guys have such a short tail, and it's very unusual, is because they live in cold adapted areas. So they live in more northern areas. In fact, actually the bobcat is found in 47 out of 50 states. And its cousin, the Canadian lynx, is found in all the Canadian provinces and including Alaska. And in those places, they are adapted for living in, in the cold. Now, what does a short tail have to do with living in the cold? Well, imagine yourself being out there in the middle of winter and you have your arms sticking out. What gets cold first? Well, if, if you've experienced the cold like I have, you'll notice that your fingers, your thumb, your hand, your nose, and your ears get cold first. That's because they kind of stick out and the blood kind of disappears from that area. Well, the same thing goes with the bobcat. It's a way to stay warmer, to keep that core temperature up, to be able to, to save on that heat, heat conservation. Uh, by if that bobcat had a long tail like say your house cat or a tiger or even a snow leopard it may lose more heat that way so it's an adaptation for not losing as much heat during those cold times of the year they still have the ability to balance they still have the ability to jump high and grab on the branches and rock cliffs and and be able to jump long distances they have that ability just like all the other cats they just have a shorter tail Another thing that bobcats have with their bobtail is that you may notice the different kinds of colors on the bobcat tail. It's kind of a, 
those black and white spots, kind of like what's on its ears. What that does is that helps the bobcat camouflage away from its prey. Bobcat's a predator, hunts a lot of different kinds of animals like squirrels, rabbits, maybe even something like a small deer. And it's harder for those animals to be able to see that bobcat when it doesn't see its whole image, when it doesn't see the shape of its ears and its tail. It disappears into the forest vegetation. My favorite thing a bobcat does with this tail though is its communication. The way that it communicates with its young. Bobcats are a solitary creature. They don't like to live with other bobcats. Except mama bobcats will live with their babies for about 18 months. And one of the ways that she communicates with those babies is through her tail. That tail, just like your dog or your cat at home, evokes emotion. It tells how the mood of that animal. If it's scared, if it's happy, if it says, please come here, the baby bobcats can actually interpret what mama is saying and what she wants them to do by the movements of that tail. So I hope you learned a little bit more about bobcats and lynxes as well as why a bobcat has a short tail. Thank you and I hope you make it to the Woodlands Nature Station. All right, so John L. Street Library patrons, I hope you had a good time learning a little bit more about animal tails. Now a tail can seem like a pretty simple thing, but as we have learned, all of these different animals use their tails in a wide variety of ways. And in some cases, it's a very important tool in allowing that animal to survive. So thank you so much for coming out and learning a little bit more with us. I hope you had a good time. and I hope to see you here at the Woodlands Nature Station sometime this summer. And I also hope you have a great summer full of reading, especially stories and tales about tales.